Welcome to the Hold the Maneuver Podcast. I'm Mark. And I'm Mike. We're two hardworking dads trying to immerse ourselves into Star Wars and fit it into our very busy lives. If this is your first time listening in this short form, well, most time we hope it's short form Star Wars podcast, we'll share our thoughts on different topics from a galaxy far, far away. Uh, what did Yoda ride as a kid, Mike? I'm really hoping it was something cool. A do cycle, because there is no try. Wah, wah. All right, everybody. So we are back with episode 19 of the Holdo Maneuver podcast. Uh, this week, we are going to be talking about the first three episodes of the Disney Plus docuseries, Light and Magic, uh, talking about the formation and beginnings of the company Industrial Light and Magic. Uh, but first, we're going to talk about some of the news that came in within the past two weeks. Uh, so the first bit was uh, Star Wars The Acolyte, the series that's going to be coming soon, uh, within the next year or so to Disney Plus uh, cast the actor Amandla Stenberg so when I saw that at first I thought it was like it was a typo or I was reading it incorrectly Mm -hmm. because I thought it was was just supposed to say Amanda but yeah she's gonna go ahead I'm just laughing because I at work I have to deal with entering creating new, uh, new accounts for all the incoming students and daily basis I get a name I'm like how do you say that? That doesn't look right. Yeah. But, yeah, if, if people have seen the Hunger Games movie, she's uh, most famous for playing the character Rue. Which, I, when stuff. you sent me the link to this, I was like, who the hell is that and why do I care? And then I read that sentence and was like, oh, that's who that was. Yeah, so there there you go. But, yeah, uh, that's, like, rumor started, uh, I guess, apparently December of last year that she was going to be in it. Uh, but she was also in the film The Hate You Give, as well as Dear Evan Hansen. Uh, And I believe, I don't remember if what the firm date is for this yet, but I just know that the Acolyte is sometime with like in the next year or so. Um, So it's... I believe the article said there is no release date. Yeah, so sometime soon. When will then be now? Be now? Hopefully it's... uh, Better than uh, what's Ben Platt or, yeah, what's it? Is it Platt? Who was in Dear Evan Hansen? Oh yeah. He w- hopefully it's uh, better than him being convincing as a teenager in that movie. Well, if anyone ever wants to see non-convincing teenagers, just go watch the movie Grease, because <laughs> those dudes are definitely like forty-five in that movie. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> I mean, Stranger Things—they're all. Most of them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, like, Steve yeah. is 31. <laughs> he's playing 22. Oh, he's, yeah, he's got a little baby face, though. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. so that, that's just... Uh, that's exciting that uh, s- some casting is finally starting to take place for that. So, uh, post... Well, not post-production. Pre-production is underway for that. So, hopefully, we will uh, find out some more about that show within the... Maybe maybe we'll find out more from D twenty three next month. Maybe not, but yeah. we will be here to tell you if we do. We'll let you know. So yeah, and then the, the the next two things we have to talk about were trailers. Uh, one is for the. Have you ever watched the the Vice TV channel at all? I don't have cable, so no. I just use or streaming you, services. Or, yeah, like the Vice streaming I've no, I've, app. To, if I have seen anything from Vice, I don't recall. Let's put it that way. So, I wouldn't have so known it was on Vice. It's a lot of stuff like this, uh, like like docu-series type stuff. Mm. Uh, are, uh, some of the people that you see, or that we saw like last episode in, the, in Search of Tomorrow, mm. uh, Doc is in this, as well as... Uh, some of the people that we saw in the light and magic are also in this. So it, it's, it, it's a, another series that's going to be, or that's going to be coming out on vice TV called icons and earth star Wars. Um, and just basically goes into the making of the film. Yeah. And, and whatnot. based on the trailer, 
I feel like you're going to get a different viewpoint than you get in Light and Magic. Like, Light yeah. and Magic will be like, oh, there was problems, but then they don't really go into it. Whereas in the trailer for this, you see a guy on fire rolling down a hill. Oh, yeah. So, I'm, yeah, some crazy stuff in that. So I feel like you're going to get a little different take, stuff that Disney might not want to put in Light and Magic. Or if Lucas had more say in that. Like, they talked to his ex-wife in Vice, the Vice series. So she might have some interesting oh, stories yeah. to ta- say. I, of course, will watch it. And, but Yeah, and they, like, she gets a mention in, in Light and Magic. Um, but, like, there's never, like, an interview with her at all in there. No, and it's, uh, every mention they had, which we'll, we'll get to, was just, like, it's more seemingly positive and how she was, like, all business. Nothing, nothing more than that. My take, at least. Yeah, and the the person that directed and kind of produced Light and Magic is Lawrence Kasdan, who people, you know, may recognize if, if you're a fan of Star Wars from... The, being involved heavily in like many different Star Wars projects, like from the original trilogy to Force Awakens and uh, Solo and a, a few other things like that. <laughs> if you do it right uh, on one, you're in them all, except for John Dykstra. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so the this show is actually already airing the Icons on Earth Star Wars. It started on July 12th. Uh, you can also go to vicetv.com. I'll post the link to this in our show notes too. Uh, where it looks like if you do have a sign-in for Vice TV, uh, the three episodes are listed there that have aired so far, because they have A New Hope split into two different parts that are about 45 minutes each. And then it looks like there's one for Empire Strikes Back, which is also about 45 minutes. So, yeah, you can find that there. Uh, and we will... Who like needs said, sleep? Be... <laughs> yeah. I'm going to watch all uh, this We'll stuff. post... Yeah, we... and... Uh, Maybe, like, once Andor's finished and there's, like... Because there's, uh, there's, like, the Bad Batch is going to be airing at the same time. But I'm going to... I think I'm going to end up covering that on Animation Fascination since it's an animated series. Mm. And and Andor will be kind of running concurrently with it. So Mm. I figure rather than having us talk about two TV series running at the same time, we'll just do that. But I am happy, speaking of Andor... In the the trailer that came out for that, we saw that it got actually moved from August 31st to September 21st, which I am happy about because uh, when Obi-Wan was airing, the back half of that was airing at the same time as the front half of Miss Marvel. Mm -hmm. And that was going to happen again with She-Hulk now with this, where like that was going to be airing the back half of that series at the same time as Andor was starting. (laughs) Which so, I can see um, Disney only doing if there is like production delays, because I don't think yeah. it would hurt them to air them like they did, because it's just more clicks on their streaming service. Yeah, the only thing with that, I think at least, is that I don't know if it's just uh, being spoiler verse. Is that like when they would release both those shows, which are both very like pop culture-esque mm-hmm. geeky content shows that are are going to be usually like the shows that are like spread word of mouth right wise online or uh, like you go on youtube and see like the here's 80 things you missed in <laughs> this week's episode of miss marvel or right this week's episode of yeah, Obi people, kenobi people will get pissed and that, because yeah you wake up at at 7 a.m and you're like this is why is this already posted <laughs> But at the same but, time, you don't have to click it. Yeah, but then there's there's some... I I tried to do this when we were posting our Obi-Wan episode was to not use a spoiler image if, if I could mm-hmm. for the thumbnail. But like sometimes, like some of those thumbnails will, will straight up just be <laughs> like the final image of the episode. Right. And, or like whatever it is. And I'm like, come on. It's like Regal uh, playing but, half the movie before the movie starts in, a pre, in an ad for Regal. Like, come on. Oh yeah, sometimes uh, when I would watch uh, stuff through the the CW streaming app, there would be ads for the next episode of the show I was watching, 
like as the as the like auto aired in yeah. between the commercial breaks, and I was like, oh, so I guess that happens <laughs> oh. in this episode. When that happened? Oh wait, it hasn't. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was like, what the like? <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, so the, the trailer for Andor, uh, the new trailer for Andor released this past week on Good Morning America, and bad ass. On, yeah. Uh, it's about two and a half minutes long, and uh, like we said, I got the premiere is going to be September twenty first, and it's going to be a three episode premiere. So who needs sleep? That's almost gonna, yeah. It's going to be like a essentially like an Andor movie movie that we get for the premiere that day. Uh, so that should be interesting because I think each of these episodes are also supposed to be like around forty five to fifty minutes long. And well, the season is 12 episodes long. The too. credits are 15 to 20 minutes in each episode. But, so, oh, yeah. With but, all Marvel and Star Wars <laughs> stuff. But yeah, this this trailer, like, there's some, like, very, like, breathtaking, like, beautiful, like, oh, cinematography yeah. in this. It's... You can see that it's, like, a mixture of, uh, like, CG work, the, uh, and then just, like, practical location stuff. Mm-hmm. I don't believe they used any of the the volume in this for like the stagecraft, like they did for Obi-Wan and like Mando and book of Boba Fett. Mm. I believe a lot of this was shot more on location and whatnot, but like in here we see like the Imperial Senate that we saw a lot of in the, the prequels. Um, it seems like we see like a younger Cassian in here as well. Mm-hmm. But the other thing that we we've seen was that this first season's meant to take place over the course of one year. I was just going to ask. I couldn't remember the breakdown. I remember we talked about it, how it was like one year yeah. for this amount, another year for this amount. So I wasn't sure if the first three episodes were the first was the first year. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so how it breaks down is that season one is set five years before Rogue One, um, and the season itself takes place over the course of one year. And then season two, uh, each... Uh, three episode chunk in that is another year uh so within that that'll be the other four years um, and then basically the finale of season two will be uh cassian basically walking into the scene that we meet him in Mm. in rogue one uh and it also seems like there's a little bit of time passage in here too just with uh uh, scars guard in here because yeah. or unless he just gets a haircut at some point because we see him like with like this like longer hair and then he goes to like a shorter hair or maybe there's i don't know if there's like flashbacks even in this too he had to go film maybe Thor. That's... that's what happened <laughs> oh yeah or and then he's just walking around naked near stonehenge uh was that the, that was a different scar oh wait no that was thor that was him drunk in one of the marvel movies yeah stone uh but yeah this like, what were some of the stuff that you, you liked the, the most from, like, some of the shots you saw in here? Nothing specific. I thought I saw Jay Urso pop up, but I know she's not in it. Oh, yeah. But there was nothing, like, cause I only watched it once, unfortunately, and that's my fault. I just ran out of time. But just the overall feel, like, you were right. I It was just the beautiful shots that you see in the trailer were just, I was like, gave me such excitement about this show because the rogue one is one of my favorite star wars films it might be my favorite but ranking them yeah. wise i kind of put it third just because of without the other without new hope and empire you probably don't have a franchise uh yeah it was just and I, I think definitely of like the disney era it's rogue one's definitely one of my favorite mm-hmm. star wars films i guess the one shot that i was just like i wish i was in a theater because it would have been so cool was when they cut to the scene where the star destroyer is just like flying overhead and you're uh, like you see it from the ground perspective oh yeah like in atmosphere mm -hmm. like it just made me just my head was like can you imagine we we see planes and stuff but can you imagine seeing that massive thing just like casually zooming by your house like I wish, I wish I had like an IMAX, like or even OmniMax experience, where you're laying back and you just see it fly overhead. Like that would have been yeah. just chills. And like you, you said that, and we kind of joked a little bit that it was 
a are gonna be like an Andor movie. Mm-hmm. I almost wish, or I wonder if they will, similar to how like they did like a a marathon of Obi Wan uh, before the finale. But that was like only in Canada, I think. Canadians It'd get be everything. Cool if maybe if, <laughs> like if they did the the premiere. Like this, these first three episodes, like if they had some kind of like ticketed event, you could go watch it. People would buy for it, so I don't know why they wouldn't do it. But yeah, that's the other thing too is like with all like these Disney Plus shows, uh, like the Marvel or Star Wars, I really like. I know it's um, probably has a very low chance of it just because they want to have some kind of worth for the streaming service. Mm. But I, w- I wish they would release, like, the Disney Plus Marvel series on uh, physical media as well yeah. as, like, the, the Star Wars series, too. I think in I, time like they, they will. Yeah. Maybe, or, like, maybe once the show is done. I don't know. Yeah, I think but, in time they will. Just because you look at Netflix and how they run their whole thing is okay, these handful, this list of movies is only available from this period of time. Watch it now or you can't see it until it comes back. But granted, most of their stuff, besides their originals, is on nah, physical media. So you just you got to yeah. think it's at some point in time it's going to happen. And some other shows get released too. Like you can get Stranger Things and uh, like Umbrella Academy mm. and like even when Orange is the New Black and stuff was on uh, like you can get those on blu-ray and stuff too um so they they do like allow that so and like even like even like other streaming services like like you can get like outlander or like any of the stuff that's on like showtime and stuff Mm. so it is kind of interesting disney's always been because they i I don't know if they still do it oh it's coming out of the vault get it before it goes back in yeah like, yeah, it's almost like a digital vault now. Mm. You can only watch it in streaming. You have to have an internet connection to be able to watch your show. Mm. Soon we'll have Disney but, internet. Yeah. Uh, some of the other stuff I thought was cool in here was like there was that scrapping planet. Uh, I know you you haven't played the, the game yet, but there's like a... Like the beginning of the Jedi Fallen Order game mm-hmm. kind of starts like on a planet that's like a scrapping planet. So I'm almost wondering if it's the same one on that. And that same planet is seen in the first season of Bad Batch 2. Mm-hmm. And we also see Saw Gerrera in here again, which is pretty cool. Just because with yeah. this character, he showed up first in the, the Clone Wars like way back. Uh, and then he showed up in Rogue One, like we saw. And then they had him show up in Rebels which was supposed to be set before Rogue One. Mm-hmm. And then he was also in that Jedi Fallen Order game. And I, what I think is interesting is, like, he's got, like, this scar going down along, like, the middle of his face in here. Mm-hmm. Cause I, I just remember, like, not to pick on Forrest Whitaker, but I just remember from Rogue One, wasn't, like, his eye, like, whited over or something? Like, I, I don't know why I'm thinking that, like, yeah, I basically, I think they, they wrote in, like, basically, like, what's going on with his eye in real life into Saw, mm. so that it was, like, part of his character in the in the movie and TV series. But I'm looking forward to seeing more of Saw in this, to see some... You want to see Saw? With him. He's, <laughs> yeah. He, he's, he's more or less like a freaking terrorist, too, just with, like, the way... He's like a... A rebel terrorist. Uh, like, Extremist? Yeah, more or less. Um, and then there's a, a new droid in here that we see, B2 Emo. Uh, he just needs the, 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 like, the hair over late the 2000s, eye. like, yeah, like, uh, Spidey 3 hair. Spidey can brush down over his eye. Is he going to poorly dance uh, down the street? And he can listen to some My Chemical Romance. <laughs> um, Why yeah, not? I, I, there. I just thought it was cool, like, a, a lot of the shots in here, like I said, there's, like, a lot of atmospheric uh, ship shots, like, where, mm-hmm. it's something they've been doing a lot lately, where it's not always, 
like you're not always seeing like an X-wing or a Tie fighter or right. like a Star Destroyer like out in space, but you're seeing them like within the yeah. And I love of, that of like planet. It just makes yeah, you there's... wonder, like, man, if we are ever get to that point with quote unquote space force, like, and, <laughs> and then like what happens? Yeah. Like you see it in um, the Force Awakens, like these these things crash into planets, like. <laughs> When they get oh, blown yeah. up, like, yeah, Jakku. Yeah, that'd be that would be interesting. Uh, yeah, or like uh, in Rise of Skywalker, you can see like what happened with the second Death Star, yeah, like how too. it landed in the in the ocean. Everyone's just like, you know what? All your your space trash is just landing on our planets. Yeah, not cool. <laughs> uh, and, but and one thing about this trailer that it was just like. Did they take that from real life? Because you think about the past four or five years and uh, who we had as president and how she, I th- I'm going to draw a blank on her name in the trailer. She's the senator. Oh, Mon Mothma? Yeah. She's like, if everyone thinks I'm being foolish or whatever, they're not paying attention to what I'm doing. Like, we kind of lived that oh, yeah. for, Christ, five years four or five years it's like hardcore yeah. lived i'm sure it's been going on forever but it was just more blatant because so yeah no basically no one pays attention to the fool they focus on they, his fool being a fool yeah. and meanwhile behind the scenes people are sneaking around doing shady shit yep 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 but was there is there any other things that you wanted to speak on about the the trailer before we move on to our light and magic? Video? I just love the the more info we got from it, based on the first teaser trailer of the when they're playing the drums, like they kind of build more oh, of what yeah. they're going for, like breaking into the empire and taking him down type deal. It just made it look so badass. More like got my hopes way up. I'm gonna. Be realistic with them, hopefully. So, looking forward right. to Andor because it looked the trailer made it look just like badass. Yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to it as well, and to discuss it in about a month and a half or so. Uh, but from there, uh, we're gonna segue into our main topic this week, where we're talking about the Disney Plus docu series. Uh, the first three episodes in this. Uh, episode of the podcast and then the when we come back uh in two weeks we'll be talking about the fourth fifth and sixth episode of it which a- after watching these first three episodes i think that was a good spot to yeah cause uh, kind of they switched cut it from off to star it's... wars to the rest of the stuff they worked on yeah yeah like these first three episodes kind of cover like the original trilogy era of ilm and then it seems like episodes four five and six of the show will be expanding to other films and uh, so on and so yeah, forth. Yeah, just how ILM blows up. And... <laughs> yeah. Uh, so in this first, the first episode was called Gang of Outsiders. And I like how they kind of segmented these two, where the first episode was more or less about the formation of ILM and the hiring of all like the key players that, that would go on to, you know, we would be like known names. Mm-hmm. Like, well, known names for like people like us that pay attention to that stuff. <laughs> uh, I almost think and, they should have and, switched one and two, had the Lucas backstory first, but I understand why they went this way because it's supposed to be about ILM. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then like season two, or sorry, not season two, episode two was uh, like basically like the George Lucas backstory. And then the third episode was kind of like putting that all together and then talking about like Empire Strikes Back and whatnot. So in that first episode, it was called Gang of Outsiders. ILM uh, kind of was founded on May 26th of 1975. And then Lucas wanted his film Star Wars to include visual effects that had never been seen on film before. Uh, so after he had discovered that the in-house effects department at 20th Century Fox, which was uh, d- going to be distributing 
Star Wars was no longer optional. Mm. Uh, he approached the uh, man Douglas Trumbull, who is best known for his effects like on 2001 A Space Odyssey and Silent Running. Uh, he declined as he was already committed to working with Spielberg on Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Uh, but he suggested his assistant John Dykstra to Lucas. And then Dykstra brought together a small team of college students... Uh, artists and engineers and set them up in a warehouse in Van Nuys, California. Um, so after seeing the map for a location was zoned as uh, Light Industrial, Lucas named the group Industrial Light and Magic. So I, I thought that was cool, kind of like how it more or less got its name just from oh, you're in an industrial warehouse, you're doing light magic, <laughs> more, more or less magic with light, uh, industrial light magic. Uh, and then it became the special effects department on Star Wars. So alongside Dykstra, uh, other leading members of the original ILM team were Ken Ralston uh, in the camera department, Richard Edlin in the camera department, uh, Dennis Murin in the camera department. I'll, and a lot of these people would, like, they showed a lot of stuff in here with, uh, uh, like, these home films that they had done when they were younger, like stop motion. Mm-hmm. And I was, like, really impressed a lot of that stuff, too. Was, I, like, I was trying to figure out how they did some of that stuff. Because I know a lot of that had to be done in camera. Mm-hmm. Or, like, with layering yeah, different it's, sets of film. That, it's just amazing. I mean, <laughs> it was so much harder to film stuff like that. I had to do a project. 60s and 50s. For a stop motion project on a modern camera. And it was so tedious and like to, for them to do it on that technology, I can, maybe it was easier, maybe because it wasn't all digital, it was easier. I don't know. Yeah. It's just, it's really impressive. And then, uh, some of the other people were Robert Bellack, uh, Joe Johnston, who, uh, I, I had, I've always been like a fan of like the films that he's directed, you know, like J- Jumanji and Captain America: The First Avenger and Rocketeer. Uh, Rocketeer. But <laughs> what, what's cool is just to see like how much of the stuff that we recognize or know to be Star Wars is like he basically came up with yeah. the design for. So whether it was like he redid the designs for like the Tie Fighters and X Wings. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the Y Y wings, he. So. The Tanti Four uh, was originally what the Millennium Falcon was going to be, in the film, and then it, like in the. Um, and I don't remember if it was episode one or episode two of this, but they were talking about one. it where, yeah, where like Lucas saw saw that like another, uh, sci-fi film that had come out. I think it was that that Silent Running, movie had a. Oddly similar. <laughs> yeah, like an oddly similar uh, spacecraft in that. Uh, so that jo- Joe Johnson had to redesign the Millennium Falcon, and he saw like the, like these two plates uh, together. So he, he ba- basically he said like the the Falcon is essentially a flying saucer uh, with like an engine on the back, and he had to use because they'd already designed the cockpit for it. and a satellite the, dish? Yeah, the satellite dish. So they were like, you just got to use these two things at least. Um, and so he was trying to figure out like different spots where to put the cockpit on it. And I thought it was funny, like he said, that they put the cockpit on the left where it is to make it more like a European <laughs> design. I've part. always wondered, like, the thought, like, I remember looking at the Millennium Falcon, and like, why do they sit way over here? And now I'm just like, oh, because the guy just wanted to be different. <laughs> I thought I didn't yeah. know. I thought there's more to it, just like I thought the Millennium Falcon was created based on uh, George Lucas biting a cheeseburger and then looking at it and be like, "That's a spaceship." Like, oh yeah, lies. Yeah, I saw you put that in the notes. Lies. Uh, and they were like they they didn't talk about it. Yet. I don't know. Maybe they talk about it in four or five or six. Uh, but he also was, although it would probably would have been. Anyways, he designed uh, Boa Fett as well, too. So that's, like, one of the things that... Yeah, they haven't talked about so Jedi yet, so... Yeah, and he designed... Well, they're like, an the... Empire. He showed up in Empire. Yeah, well, and then he was in the deleted scene in, in 
the original Star Wars too. So he would have, I guess he would have had to design them for that movie. But they didn't really talk. The, they talked about the um, aliens in the cantina a lot and all the other creatures, but they didn't really talk about like Darth Vader and stormtroopers, the people with helmets. And if, now that I think about it, yeah, I think a lot of with that. Uh, they talked about like the Ralph McQuarrie concept art mm-hmm. uh, with like what he was doing. Yeah, they showed that, that so, like, and the concept art that Lucas saw and was like, "That is it. That conveys my message perfectly." But yeah, like the classic, like like the classic concept art everybody associates with Star Wars too, like those images of three PO and R two, or like the like the trooper like holding a lightsaber more or less basically mm. um they, but they i always think it's cool them. to yeah uh and then uh, phil Tippett, who i've i liked i have liked a lot of the stuff with him in this doc documentary uh, so far uh, he was in the model shop so he did like a lot of the stuff with the like the like different like stop motion stuff and as well he got uh, he, he also got real in the one episode but he was just like yeah i posted <laughs> i have bipolar and if, if i didn't do this I, i'd be dead like i would have killed myself i was like man this just took a turn yeah like we're, yeah I, I posted someone about that where like i was like identifying with him like basically putting himself in or like escaping into like 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 the stuff like this that like he loves to basically take himself like away from like the edge and to, to mm-hmm. get away from like his anxiety and depression and stuff. Right. So I thought that was was cool that they put and like you could tell like even him like bringing it up was kind of like triggering stuff yeah. with them too. It was a real moment. Like I was was not expecting it. Yeah, and he's got his own uh, his like own effects studio now too. Like that's called Tippet Studio. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was cool to to see him in there too, uh, and like he also would like design like the Tauntaun that we would see in Empire, mm-hmm. uh, and then like a few of the other people that were in here too were Steve Golly, Lauren Peterson in the model shop, uh, Harrison Ellenshaw who was the matte painter, uh, whose father was a matte painter that worked on a lot of films for Walt Disney. I'm not a fan like of his interviews. Mary Poppins. Uh, like when he talks. Oh yeah. I just kind of get this vibe like nobody really liked you. <laughs> Like, you kind of seem <laughs> well, th- pretentious to me for some reason. Well, I thought it was funny with, like, when they were doing the matte paintings for Empire, uh, where, like, he didn't like the clouds. how Ralph McQuarrie was doing the clouds. So he, he was like, Ralph, you, you do... Everything else. <laughs> all of, of, like, all this stuff. I'll, I'll do the clouds. It's okay. Because he was saying, like, the col- like it looked like cauliflower or yeah. something like that. And I thought that was kind of interesting um no, that's yeah, cool that, like, cool and like he does fantastic work and just in his interviews yeah. i just like i don't really like you <laughs> as a person and um i was i was lucky enough to get to go to ilm a few years ago back in 2017 and they have like a lot of these matte paintings hanging on the walls like in the hallways there mm-hmm. uh and i don't know if he I'm assuming he did because it might have been like around the same time that he would have been there. But there's like they have this the matte painting from Spielberg's movie Hook, mm-hmm. that's uh, like that overhead shot of Neverland, right? Uh, and they have that hanging there, and they have like a matte painting from E.T. That's like that shot from like up on top of the hill that E.T. can see like the city down but mm-hmm. beneath in the suburbs and stuff. Uh, so that's really cool. If he didn't and do then, it, like, he Kobe's... oversaw it. Like, put it that way. Yeah. Uh, and then the uh, we saw in episode three there was the the Kerner building that they moved to in in Marin County. Uh, that was another thing too. They have that they have that door that they showed in the documentary. It's hanging on the wall, just in one of the hallways of mm-hmm. ILM now. So I think it's kind of cool that they they were so sentimental about the door to the building. They're like, we're gonna take this door. Might as well. Bye. They but, built them a new one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I th- thought it was kind of funny too. Was like basically they spent most of their uh, budget budget on like basically making the models and everything, inventing things and, too. Like, 
Yeah. Like, it was just crazy to me. They had to invent technology to make this movie, and then, of course, that costs money, and then Lucas gets mad because they didn't get enough done. Like, well, what you wanted to do couldn't have been done unless we did this. Yeah, they said the, like, the the cannon shot and the, um, the, the skate, skate pod shot. Yeah. Which, now that I know about that, too, is, like, if you look at that shot, you'll notice that there's not any stars. Yeah, I, I saw that, too. I'm sure... I'm sure now they've probably added stuff. Yeah, and that's it. what I was like. The whole time I'm watching this, I'm at the end of episode one. I was like, "Man, I need to see that rough cut that they talk about, without any sound, oh, without yeah. any like other other stuff." And then I'm like, "I also need to see the unremastered ones, the originals, to see what it actually looked like." Oh, yeah. Cause I've never the... seen the original originals. I've only seen the remastered ones. Oh, yeah. Where they've added stuff. I, and... I was able to find the the, the specialized editions uh, a few years ago on Blu-ray, uh, but I remember there was a there was a DVD set that I think Best Buy or someone did that was like those original versions of the film came as bonus features mm-hmm. on like on the special features like discs, right? But it wasn't like remastered or anything, and it was just like in stereo. So we're like, is we're like, we'll give it to you, but we're not gonna. I'm sure that's, that's the way gonna... it is. Like, yeah, th- I want to see it as everyone else saw it when they first came out, because I've never seen that. You want to see it like Eric Foreman saw it? Yes. <laughs> when he went to the theater and watched it. I yeah, I want to like, cause like my parents, they never talk about when they saw Star Wars if they saw it, but they remember telling they them telling me about Jaws and all this other stuff at the Shine Theater in Auburn having just like blocking oh, yeah. traffic downtown because it was so packed with people. So it's like, they saw it. Why can't I see it? Damn it. Yeah. Uh, some of the stuff I thought was funny in this, this too was like how they had like this, because it was like in like a warehouse, there wasn't like an air conditioning. Mm-hmm. So they would like fill up like this small square like bin basically with cold water <laughs> make a hot the cold hot treat, it, yeah like a, yeah like there was like some of these pictures in there where it was like eight of them sitting in it at once um or and then uh joe johnston said that his dad had like bought like one of like the escape slides mm-hmm. from like an airplane and they were using it as a slip and slide he's like what else are yeah you well, gonna, what the hell are you gonna do it? you can't escape a plane with it anymore put it put it on your plane <laughs> but i i thought that was cool yeah uh but was was there anything uh that stuck out from that first episode as we're kind of the fact that they had to two and three? just what they had to invent in the time when like computers were so knew for what they could do like what they had to create yeah. analog versions of just to get these shots it's like you you know they did it but then you see what went into it and you're just like holy hell these people are just sheer geniuses um yeah i was interested they how they really kept... down no oh, go ahead i was just gonna say they really downplayed themselves as like creating a lot of that yeah. stuff too like well because to them it was just like that's what we had to do <laughs> yeah uh they really downplayed the schism in between like the rift between dykstra and lucas because it's oh yeah the... like you know that they were screaming at each other a lot i bet but they don't really talk about that just yeah. and, then... and that 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 seems like it was still kind of like a rift like a touchy th- yeah. thing to even bring up still because like you could see like lucas kind of got kind of tight like the like like yeah him and dykstra both kind of like you could see like they got kind of sad almost mm-hmm. about it yeah uh, they, they're they they didn't really want to open up that's why i'm kind of like that vice mentioned before that vice series might have a little more insight to that yeah and then there's and dykstra's in that too there's La Lucas's wife, who I think was the editor, right? Marsha Lucas? 
Um, What'd they say she was doing? I'll double check that. I forgot what she was working on. I'll double check, uh, but yeah, she was just talking about other stuff. Yeah, it's just interesting how they was the editor. They didn't talk to her. She was just mentioned a lot. Yeah, which I can see her being like, I don't really want to be anything about my ex husband, but. Yeah, she edited uh, a bunch of stuff. Yeah, edited Empire, Jedi, uh, Taxi Driver, THX 1138. Yeah. And then the other Warner aspect Graffiti. that came up that I never once thought about was how the spaceships aren't smooth. Like, they oh, look... Yeah man-made they like they have the rivets they have the panels they have the electrical stuff showing like it never dawned on me like oh yeah that's a cool aspect to have thought about and and, like want for your ships is to make them look like someone had to make this it wasn't just a giant like they say in the show like a giant sheet of aluminum formed to look like this one thing like you know these were not piecemealed, but just pieced together. And like how the rebels ships were like meant to look like the poor man's ship. Like they got hand me down stuff that they had to like modify to work. Oh yeah. They, they made some line where like the, the empire stuff was like, like off the assembly line Mm -hmm. and the, like the rebels were like, um, it was supposed to be like street racer, yeah. or like hot rods, like hot rods and stuff. Like where it was like, oh, I'm gonna put like the souped up engine back here on this. Yeah. I'm gonna put put some pinstripes over here and whatnot. So it was like basically, it's like Fast and Furious Space mm-hmm. Star Wars. I I never had that like connection, and it was just like it adds another layer to what makes this franchise different, especially at the time. Like yeah. And I think that's a lot with, like, when they get into... Like, I had known a lot of this backstory already just from, like, other stuff that, mm-hmm. like, I've watched about Lucas before. But, like, when they go into, like, a lot of George Lucas's backstory, like, growing up in Modesto and stuff in the second episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, like, talking about, like, how he, he, like, loved racing cars and liked liked going fast and stuff like that. I knew about uh, you the can car see, accident, like, but I didn't know about the other stuff. Yeah, like, and like you can kind of see like how that like plays into some of his films. Like after that, with like how shots are done, or just like like American Graffiti, or like uh, like like these like very fast, energetic mm-hmm. shots in like THX. Now, I don't know if this is a personal thing where I always call it THX eleven to thirty eight, but then whenever I hear one, someone one, talk three, about it, like it, yeah, they say it like each number by itself. Do you call it eleven thirty eight? I always say eleven thirty eight. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So <laughs> it always throws me off. I'm like, wait, what are you talking about? I understand uh, why I... they say one one three eight, because it's supposed to play into yeah. that, like he's that's his name. Like everyone's got this number and you say it this way. So like But I always yeah. say eleven thirty eight. <laughs> Which there's a uh there's a nice little Easter egg for that in American Graffiti. One of the license plates in that says THX 1138 in that too. And THX 1138 shows up at, in a bunch of stuff as like a as an Easter egg. I, I believe it's the name of... It's one of the cells, jail cells in Star Wars yeah, say too. There's all kinds of references to it in Star Wars. Not to mention everything is filmed with THX sound or whatever. Yeah, and what... Uh, what was kind of cool is like that first episode showed like what the team was doing like while Lucas was in London working on shooting the film and then like the second episode basically then went to like his point of view of like what he was doing with shooting the film in London Mm -hmm. and what was going on there and like how when he came back what was going on and all of that Mm -hmm. and like how I liked that at one interview with the production assistant that they had hired uh where she didn't know she was talking to Lucas. Yeah, he was sitting right next to her. Yeah, she was, like, asking him, like, questions. Like, I always like those stories where, like, someone's, like, like talking to the person and, like, asking the person if, if so-and-so's a jerk and, like, right. that's who they're talking to. 
The only other one that comes to mind for me is uh, John Krasinski on The Office was sitting in the lobby for his audition, and Greg Daniels was there talking to him, and he didn't know who it was. And he was like, I oh, hope yeah. this is good, because usually when we do British adaptations, they suck. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, yeah. Or something like that. along those lines. But it is interesting. Yeah. I, I want to know more. I feel like people are tiptoeing around it. I just want to know more of, like, the real set life. Because everyone paints Lucas as this, oh, he's calm, but internally he's screaming at himself. But I, he's got to be demanding. And he's got to be a little yeah. more in your face about it when it's not going his way, I feel. Like, there's this persona yeah. he's etched, so, like, public persona, but this... Uh, well, and the third episode has called it too, but uh, I like the whole thing with the just think about it. It's an interesting where, uh, technique to use on people, for sure. Yeah, where, I, like Dennis Muren was talking about, like he was basically saying like a shot was like impossible to like do of like mm. the Tauntaun running along like the shot they had got already. Yeah. Uh, when they had shot stuff on location, and then like he thought about it for like ten or fifteen minutes, and then he had figured it out. <laughs> Yeah, it's, and he's like, oh, okay, well, I guess. Don't give up on it. Like, what? you can do it. Like, encouragement. But it's yeah. kind of, like, it is an interesting psycho psychological trick. Well, just think about it. And like, Lucas being, he was a psych major for a while, so. Yeah, I I, I do think it's like always interesting with some of the, the st stuff like that, or like with, kind of like creative people, or like. Where you have something like in your head, mm -hmm. uh, some like they like said something where like he said he only got to make like twenty five percent of what like he had wanted <laughs> to put on a I screen know. for Star Wars, and like then you can I mean then you really see why like with the special edition mm -hmm. stuff like why he would add stuff like that because he was wanting to m make it go up from the twenty five percent to I don't know fifty. 75 percent so each time it came out if 25 percent was what came out and how good it was at 25 percent you don't know and that's kind of like i've had this battle when i've done stuff like okay it's great here but i wish i did this and then you go back and add that and you're like oh now it's not good like there's that fine line like he's made yeah. decisions with the re-releases and stuff where it's like that really didn't add anything like was it needed? Yeah, it's almost, it's almost like with Jaws, with like the the shark not working, and because it didn't work, you had a that made create the made the film otherwise. better yeah. because of the way yeah he had to shoot around it, uh, and then so like in this we kind of talked about it already, but like in this third episode too, it's about them moving to the Kerner Building in Marin County, uh, working on Empire Strikes Back, and then bringing back a bunch of the people that worked. On Star Wars, but not everybody. Except and in John Dykstra. <laughs> yeah, John Dykstra. Which, yeah, like we had already said, that it seemed like that was still like a touchy kind of thing to. And it's funny, he's like. About everyone's like, you just won an Oscar for the biggest movie you've ever made, like in the world, and you're so highly regarded. Oh, you're fired. Like. <laughs> yeah. And it was interesting that, like, in between Star Wars and that, like, he'd also worked on the original Battlestar Galactica series. Mm. So, and, like, they were making some of that stuff at ILM, too, so that was kind of interesting, I thought, too. Were they making it ILM, or was it just him and the same little group of people doing it? Yeah, it was It was. Yeah, it was. Yeah, them at ILM doing because it. Because I was getting confused, because the way they were talking about in this episode, how it made it seem like they disbanded, and then they reformed ILM again. I don't know, just... I think it was just that Lucas didn't want to be down in, in like Los Angeles County. Yeah, he, I that, I got so like, that, and then, but like they, there's a line, like I had to keep him busy. That's like that's because that's how he pawned him off on Spielberg, not pawned, but had him work with Spielberg on Raiders because he was like I had to keep him busy so they were ready for me when I came back, and it just made me think like, okay, did they disband and then you just reformed them? for Empire, and right. then you're like, I gotta really keep them together now, so now ILM's formed. But, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, there's kind of little intermediate stuff in there, for sure, definitely. Um, some of the stuff I thought was funny, though, was that 
uh, there's potatoes mm-hmm. in the, the asteroid. I remember uh, feel, like hearing that or reading that somewhere before, but I did, I thought it was one potato, like as a joke. And then I was like, no, wait, that oh, was yeah. Spaceballs. And then they confirm it here that it was a lot of potatoes. Yeah. So it'd be funny to go back and, like, watch and try to just pick a potato look for the potatoes. <laughs> it's uh, a new drinking game. Spot but, the potato. But, yeah, after here in, like, 1978, after, like, the pre-production for Empire Strikes Back, and they had uh, moved to, to Marin County, they would go on to expand... And to produce special effects for near nearly three hundred films. After that, so well, they became like the industry uh, standard. Yeah, I liked too, like how this third episode opened, uh, with like different people that have worked uh, for Lucasfilm or with Lucasfilm or with Industrial Industrial Light and Magic, talking about when they first saw saw Star Wars. Mm-hmm. Uh, so. Uh, like our buddy Hal Hickel was the first dude that they spoke to in there, and then they had G.J. Abrams, mm-hmm. John Knoll, John Favreau, Ron Howard was in yeah, there. Yeah, Ron Howard. I thought his story was funny because he's like, "Oh, we just went to the Tarman's Chinese Theater and saw it like casually, <laughs> dropping that one." And then he's like, "We came out, and we're oh, like, yeah. okay, let's get in line again." <laughs> well, then he'd be like, "Yeah, that's my friend. I just, I just did American Graffiti with him," but. I think that I think that whole kind of like a uh, loop of like how Ron Howard's connected to Star Wars is kind of interesting too. Just between between like, well, I mean he produced this this docu series too, mm-hmm. uh, but then like between being in American Graffiti and then directing Willow and then um, directing Solo recently, and then his daughter Bryce Dallas Howard directing a bunch of. Mando's episodes of the the mandalorian and stuff it's just kind of cool like how interweaved his family is with star wars after the fact and how much of solo did he direct though that's I, i've always wondered that because didn't he get brought in because the original guy got like he was having so many problems and like he just got brought in oh, to yeah, finish with, it. um with uh what's, what's their names the chris miller and um and I'm blanking on both their names right now. I don't remember. Uh, who did, like, the, the Lego movie. I just remember hearing, like, uh, horror stories. Phil, Phil Lord and... Yeah, Phil Lord and Chris Miller, uh, who, who like, worked on, like, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse and uh, Cloud's Chance of Meatballs mm. and stuff like that. I was hearing uh, just, like... Just because... I was a train wreck of a production with them there, and they got to, like... I don't know, a high percentage of being done, and then the son was like, you guys have got to go, and then they brought Howard in. Yeah, I'm still not sure, like, entirely what happened with that. I know, like, he filmed a lot of stuff, but he didn't have to refilm, like, at least one-third of the movie, I think. Mm-hmm. But some of the, like, the cool notable milestones that ILM has had, too, uh, well, like, within this time period that we're covering in this episode was that uh, 1975, they resurrected the use of VistaVision uh, for the first use of, of a motion control camera uh, with like the Dijkstra, Dijkstra Flex camera that they they created. Um, the first use of Go Motion to animate the Tauntaun creatures in Empire Strikes Back in 1980, and then in 1982, uh, it was the first in-house completely computer-generated sequence for the Genesis sequence in the Wrath of Khan. Uh, previously computer graphics in the first film were done outside of IM, and they kind of start talking about it in this, this episode too uh when ed catmill comes in who had gone to school for like computer science and had started to develop it like animation and stuff like that they don't talk about it yet but basically when he started with ILM, he was working with the pixar processing computer which you know Pixar eventually became its own thing and went on from there. But that's like that's where Ed Catmull started. Mm-hmm. Was within Industrial Light and Magic, mm-hmm. and then would go on to be Pixar himself. Yeah, two things on the milestones was did they call it Go Motion in this? Because I got I got a little upset that they didn't. Because in uh, in search of tomorrow, I don't know if they. 
Yeah, I don't know if they did specifically in the the doc. Because I was like, I was waiting for him to talk about it again because I remember learning about it in In Search of Tomorrow, and they never said it. And I was like, did they lie to us in that one too? Like, come on. <laughs> but, yeah. um, and then I never had any idea that Pixar basically was formed in ILM first. I yeah. was the, well, the other Steve Jobs created it for some reason. Yeah, like the other cool thing too is that uh, Photoshop was also developed at Industrial Light and Magic too. I believe it. So, yeah, so that was that was another John Knoll thing that was uh, developed there to basically use for, and like actually, if you save like there's a, if you can save a file, in Photoshop as like a Pixar file type. Mm-hmm in there too but yeah like if you ever see the original logo for pixar it's just basically the square with like an indent like in the middle mm. and that's basically what like the pixar computer processor looked like um but and think about this pixar became... computers back then ran on megabytes of and not even megabytes like just like bytes of ram yeah. and stuff and we're up here running on gigs and terabytes and stuff and yeah. it's just like it blows my mind how where computers started and what they were able to do with them compared to how angry we get when our much faster quote unquote superior computers go slow. It's like yeah, it's kind of crazy. And like Industrial Light and Magic nowadays have the biggest render farm in the world, and they have it, it's called the Death Star. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. Uh, and then the, so the films that were produced during this era that we discussed too, uh, were the first Star Wars movie was the first movie they ever did, uh, Empire Strikes Back, Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, Dragon Slayer, Conan the Barbarian, Wrath of Khan, E.T., uh, The Dark Crystal, and Poltergeist. So, I thought that was interesting, and like they, like, as this episode was ending, you could kind of see them starting to talk about, like, mm-hmm. that other stuff. So... I'll be curious to watch like these last three episodes over the next two weeks or so when we go and when we talk about those last three in the next episode of this, just to, cause that I'll be getting into like Jurassic Park and right. how it went from like what they started as to like what they are now with like the CG um, animation and everything from there. Is there anything else you wanted to say about the the first three episodes before we close out? I thought it was. Uh... The stop motion when they showed that. It's always fascinating for me to watch people do stop motion because I'm just too impatient for it. So to, to oh, yeah. watch them do it and the results they get is just mind-blowing. And I would, I always knew the chess um, game was stop motion, but I never... It was just cool to see it put together. Like I never imagined it how that, it's how it came together. So that was kind of a night oh, yeah. thing. I, I like how... One. I liked how that was originally supposed to be people, like, like yeah, like live action people. But then the movie Future World did that, mm-hmm. uh, so they Lucas was like, "Nope, we got, we got to do something different instead." Change, uh, swerve. Was, yeah, I can only imagine. But, and again, this, the sheer amount of artwork that came out of there that was thrown on the floor because nope, oh, not approved, not approved, not approved. Oh yeah, they said that too, that they stopped putting the original stuff up on the board because they knew that Lucas would just write on it with his Rip red down. marker, so they started making copies to put them on the, the thing so that they and I, the, that the original want to get messed up. The revelation that Lucas couldn't draw, for some reason I thought he was involved heavily in the actual drawing of the stuff, not just like, okay, may, this is what I'm envisioning, and he drew like basic basically something I would draw, just like lines on paper that's crude, but you get the point across, and then someone else masters it. I thought he drew way more concept stuff himself. I never realized he didn't. It's like that meme of the the horse that's being drawn by somebody, Mm -hmm. where like one part of it looks like super well done, and then like the back half of it's like a stick figure. Yeah. Yeah, Joe, Joe Johnston's on the left. George Lucas is on the right for the for the art. Uh, but yeah, I'm excited to watch the last three episodes of this and talk about those next time as well. Uh, but you guys can leave us a review on the podcast catcher of your choice if it allows you to. Do so, it helps us out a lot. 
Uh, so Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever it lets you do so, do it. And you can find the show on social media at Twitter and Instagram at Holdapod, as well as Facebook at Holdapod, and on YouTube by searching for the Hold'em Maneuver podcast. You can find us individually on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, I am at Mark Vibbert, M-A-R-C-V-I-B-B-E-R-T. I'm at Michael Soren. Just search my name, Michael Soren, S-A-W-R-A-N. Uh, if there's a middle initial that comes up, that's usually me. If you find one without one, um, and there's kind of being weird rants about race and lazy people, that's not me. That's someone else. Don't follow him. Follow me. Yeah. Uh, I don't post much. Editor... That's another way you can tell. <laughs> also, just look for the picture, too. Um, our editor, uh, you can find him on Instagram and Twitter, too, at Vactor. And you can email us at holdapod at gmail.com. But as always, we are grateful to George Lucas for creating the Star Wars universe. <laughs> Thanks to the maker. <laughs> <laughs>